Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Good to see you. You can respond. It's okay. Yes, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Did you know today is National Grandparents Day? Isn't that great? We deserve more than one day. Come on. How many of you are grandparents? Raise your hand. Oh, wow, lots of grandparents. What does this say? It just says, I'm glad you're all here in church today. Here's a picture of me with uh, my grandkids and Kathy as well uh, when we were over in Maui uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, so look at this next photo. This is my grandson jumping over everybody. Look at that. It looks fake. It looks like it's posed. That's a real photograph, no Photoshop. We just kind of got it all captured. At the same time, the girls, the look in their faces, and he cleared them. He, that was a good jump, wouldn't you say? All right, good jump. Well, we're starting a brand new series today in the book of Joshua. So if you don't know where that is, just start at the beginning of your Bible, go about six books in, and you'll hit it. The book of Joshua. And I'm looking forward to this new series that we're going to be doing. I also want to say good morning to uh, all of our campuses right now. Welcome to church. And let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for the church. We're thankful, thankful for our church family, our brothers and sisters. And we pray that you will bless this time as we open your word. Your word is truth. And we know that we cannot live a successful Christian life without your word is a major part of our lives. So speak to us as we open scripture and bless this time we ask now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The title of my message is How to Live a Successful Christian Life. I think every one of us remembers the day that we asked Jesus Christ to come into our life. Am I right? You remember that day. It was a day that changed everything. It was a day when everything went from black and white to color. And by the way, I am old enough to remember when color television came out. Does anyone agree, understand that? Uh, you, know, you all have never even known color, anything but color TV, but back when I was a kid, it was black and white. And the, giant, the TVs were gigantic. And there was no remote control. If you wanted to change a channel, there were only like three channels. You had to actually get up, walk over to it, and turn it to the next channel. And then we had something called rabbit ears. They were like little antennas and, oh, my signal's bad. You're adjusting the rabbit ears. And, and so, but then one day, color TV came out. You can't imagine what it's like to go from black and white television to color. And that's what it's like to become a Christian. It's like going from black and white to color. It's going from death to life. It's such a radical transformation. Now, as a Christian, sin no longer had control over you. Your addictions fell away. Your depression cleared. Your guilt was removed. And there was a new inward peace and a fresh joy you had never known before. You opened up your Bible and it was so relevant. You were surprised at how it spoke to you. I remember when I first began reading the Bible at 17. I'd never read the Bible before. And it, and it was so relevant to me as a 17-year-old. And it's still so relevant to me as a 40-year-old, <laughs> plus a few more years. But <laughs> it's just as relevant today as it was back then. And then the church, what a radical thing it was to discover the church, especially for me, to meet people that love the Lord of all ages, of all backgrounds. And I just so loved worshiping and hearing Bible studies and, and growing in my faith. And I remember the first time God answered my prayer. Because I was told, you can pray and ask God for things, really. And so my first prayer was, God, will you give me a Bible? Uh, because I was just a kid. I didn't have any money. I was given a crummy little paperback Bible, and I wanted a proper Bible with leather and ribbons and the whole deal, a fancy Bible. So I literally prayed, God, give me a Bible. And my grandmother called me. And I had lived with her and my grandfather for a number of years in my childhood. And she said, I heard that you became a Christian and I want to buy you a really nice Bible. Well, I didn't prompt her to say that. That was my first answered prayer. And the Bible itself and all that was happening in my life was radical. And you said, I'll never go back to that old life again. From this point on, it's going to be blue skies, singing birds, sunshine, butterflies, 
and maybe a unicorn, who knows, we'll see. But then, then you began to sort of go back a little bit. You started having some issues. Then you came to a point in your Christian experience where it was like one step forward and two steps back. You found yourself and could, and could best be described as sort of a spiritual wilderness and you wondered how did this happen. Well that can change for you if you wanted to. So the book of Joshua is a story of the end of the wilderness wanderings of the Jewish people and their entry into the promised land. We, fee we find out how they entered into the promised land. And for us, it's a land of promises. That's why we've called this series Joshua Living in the Land of Promises. The Bible is filled with promises from God to you. So many great and precious promises as the Bible describes them. As an example, God promises spiritual rest to all who believe in him. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you with rest. The Bible promises eternal life to whoever believes because Jesus said in John 4, 14, if you drink the water I give, you'll never be thirsty again. It will become a fresh bubbling spring within you, giving you eternal life. The Bible also promises a rich and satisfying life. John 10, 10, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly, or as another translation puts it, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. Promises, so many of them. But a lot of times we don't act on those promises. They're like those gift cards we get. You know gift cards. Christmas is coming, isn't it? Can you believe it? You're already seeing the Halloween stuff in the stores. And so Christmas is gonna be here before you know it and you may receive or give gift cards. And, uh, and the problem is we have a bunch of old gift cards that were never used. Am I the only one? Like, hey, I, let's see what we have in the gift cards. Oh great, Blockbuster Video, I don't know if that. <laughs> oh, here's one for Sears, that's really gonna be helpful. I use. Oh, but no, I've got a Radio Shack gift card. Is there still a Radio Shack anywhere? I think there may be a single Blockbuster store out there somewhere, but you know, those cards aren't worth much. They, they had an expiration date because the stores don't exist anymore. But the promises of God have no expiration date. They're always good. You just need to claim them. You need to take advantage of them and the promises of God are the same. You see, Israel were freed from the bondage of Egypt after they prayed and called out to God to send someone to deliver them and the Lord sent Moses. Moses the great lawgiver. Moses who was originally being groomed to become the next Pharaoh of Egypt according to the Jewish historian Josephus. Moses the prince of Egypt who was groomed and developed by God to be an answer to the prayer of the people of Israel. And he went to the Pharaoh and boldly said, let my people go. <laughs> and the Pharaoh didn't like that idea. A series of plagues came upon Egypt Finally, the Pharaoh relented and the Israelites were free to go to the promised land. Now they just had to get from point A to point B and it's not that far to go from Egypt to Israel on foot, a month at the most, maybe two months if you're really taking your time. But 40 years, <laughs> there's no way it takes that long. And the reason it took 40 years is because they were wandering around in circles, disobeying God. And the Lord led them with the most amazing GPS system ever created, a cloud by day and a fire by night. When the cloud moved, it was time to go. When the cloud stopped, you stopped. When the fire moved, same thing. It was amazing and he fed them every day with this supernatural substance called manna. It's described in the Bible as the food of angels. It's also described as being sweet and it's also described as being flaky like frost. It's from the root word frostoflaco, <laughs> where we get our English words frosted flakes. <laughs> yeah, not really. But um, every day they would wake up and there would be the frostoflaco. There would be the manna. Scoop it up, enjoy it, eat it. God would provide for you. Everything they had they needed, but 
They disobeyed God and they started wandering around in circles. And we can do the same thing, can't we? We start taking the blessings of God for granted. We find ourselves going around in circles instead of going forward. And here in the book of Joshua, you can find how to get out of your wilderness into the land of promises. Commenting on what happened to the people of Israel in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul wrote this. These things happened to them as examples to us. They were written to warn us who live at the end of the age. That's very important. So Paul's saying, these words are for us living at the end of the age. Us who are waiting for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And we just talked about that in our last series. Then he continues on. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different than what others experience. And God is faithful and it will not allow that temptation to be more than you can stand. So when you're, attempt, when you're tempted, he'll show you a way out that you might endure. So again, these words are written to believers living in the last days. He brought them out of Egypt to bring them into the promised land. We're told in Exodus 22, God speaking, I brought you out to bring you in. And in the same way, he wants to bring us into this land of promises, into a land as a follower of Jesus where we have victory over sin. Now listen, that doesn't mean we live a sinless life. It doesn't mean we don't fall short. It doesn't mean we don't stumble and fall here and there, but we're no longer living in a pattern of sin. We're no longer dominated by sin. This can be your present Christian experience if you want it to be. But Joshua is a book of war, and that might surprise some people. We would wonder why, why is such a place given in the Bible of the military victories and sometimes defeats of the army of Israel? Well, answer, because we too are at war. We're having a big war right now. Now, it's a culture war, but it's more than that. It's a political war, but it's more than that. Really what it is, it's, it's a spiritual war. And have you noticed how it's really ramped up and everything seems to be in hyperdrive? Speaking about this, Paul says in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age against a spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. As a modern paraphrase puts it, this is no longer a weekend war that you can walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and his angels. Listen, the devil knows Jesus is coming. The devil knows his days are numbered. And that's why he's ramping up his efforts. Revelation 12, 12 says, Rejoice heavens, but terror has come down to you. The devil has come down to you in great anger because he knows he has a little time. The devil knows his time is limited. So he is trying to wreak as much havoc as he can until the day of the return of the Lord. And in the same way, we too should be doing as much as we can as we await the return of Jesus Christ. So listen, this is not a choice of fighting or not fighting. Uh, this is a choice of victory or defeat, advancing or retreating, winning or losing. Now you might say, well, I'm a pacifist, man, and I drive a Prius <laughs> with my cat wearing a mask all by myself because <laughs> I might get COVID in the car from something, I don't know. Look, you gotta, it's time to man up, <laughs> woolen up, if you will, and be courageous, and get in this battle, and instead of losing ground, start gaining ground, Amen. right? <laughs> and I've offended all the Prius drivers who wear masks, <laughs> and cat owners, I posted something on my story on Instagram the other day, a video I came across. A little boy, very small, like a toddler, was at a railing. I wish I had this video to show you. Is that the railing? It's dangerous. And this crazy cat runs over and like pulls his hands down. The little guy puts his hands on the railing again. There are a very high balcony and the cat comes and knocks his hands down. And I, I posted it and said, some cats are good. Okay, so there, <laughs> there, are, there are some good cats out there. I like this cat. You're, but this battle will rage 
for your entire life. I heard about a younger Christian who came to an old believer, older believer and said, how long will it be when I no longer am tempted? The old man said, when you're dead. That's it. It never is going to stop. And so there'll always be a battle. And you'll think, I'm not gonna have any more problems in life. No more struggles, no more temptations. No, they're just gonna change. They might be different than they were when you were younger. Then again, they might be the same temptations that come back to you again and you're surprised that they're returning to you. It's always going to continue on throughout your life. You know, for me, the easiest thing to turn my back on was drinking and drugs. As a, a young man, and I never got into hard drugs, but you know, I, I got into smoking weed and LSD. You all seen it in the Jesus Revolution film. So <laughs> I was a stupid kid making bad decisions, and I came to Christ, and the easiest thing for me was to turn my back on it. And you know why? I already hated it even before I was a Christian. I already said, I don't want to live this life. I know this is a dead end street. I know this is the wrong way to live. I don't know how I should live, but I don't want to live that way. So when I became a Christian, the easiest thing was to walk away from that. But I know some people still struggle with these things. And I have compassion for them. I'm in no place to judge them because they have a struggle in an area I don't have a struggle in. We all have our struggles in life. And, and we're all gonna have to fight this battle to the very end. But listen to this. There is no addiction that should control your life. You can be free from it through Christ. You can. And then when you do sin, and we all will, we need to accept the forgiveness of God. And we'll say, well, I, you know, I, I just need to forgive myself. Where did that even come from? Why do you think you can forgive yourself? You can't forgive yourself, only God can forgive you. So really what you need to do instead of forgiving yourself is understand how amazing God's forgiveness is, how all-encompassing it is, and apply it in your life. Going back to the Israelites when they were in Egypt, God's judgment came upon the land and God was going to judge all the firstborn. The Pharaoh tried to kill the firstborn of the Jews and the Lord said, you keep this up and the same thing's going to happen to you. Well, he kept it up. And the judgment came on the firstborn uh, children of Egypt. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, take the blood of a lamb and apply it to your doorpost. Put it on the top, put it on the right, put it on the left. And when I see this blood, I'll pass over your home. And of course, that was all pointing to Jesus, who was a Passover lamb slain for us. And so they had to apply the blood to have the judgment of God pass over. In the same way, I need to apply the blood of my life. And what that means is, looking back at Revelation, it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. So when you've sinned, you say, Lord, you died on the cross for my sin. You paid for this sin that I've committed. I'm sorry for this sin. I repent of it and I accept your forgiveness. You don't need to forgive yourself. Accept his forgiveness and apply it in your life. But anyway. We come now to this amazing story. Now, let me give you a couple details before we read some verses together. Uh, and I, I want to point out that when they first came to this land, by the way, when they left Egypt, they made a quick path to the entry point of the promised land called Kadesh Barnea. And they dispatched 12 spies to check it out. Frankly, they should have just gone in. God gave them the land. Well, let's check it out. Let's see what's going on. 12 spies. And the 12 spies took time to see what was in the land. They saw how big the inhabitants were. They saw how big the fruit was. A cluster of grapes so large it took two guys to take it out of the land, which is also the symbol of tourism in Israel today, that picture of two men, Joshua and Caleb, carrying the cluster of grapes. But they saw the obstacles and they came back and gave a report. There was the majority report and there was the minority report. The majority said, it's scary. We felt like we were grasshoppers to the people living there comparatively. We shouldn't go in. Two others, Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, the obstacles are big, but God is bigger. Let's go for it. But the people did not listen to Joshua and Caleb. They listened to the others. 
reminding us when you fix your attention on the obstacles rather than the objective, fear will always eclipse your faith. It's there in the screen. When you focus on your obstacles rather than the objective, fear will always eclipse your faith. That's what the people did. Because of that, the Lord said, none of you are gonna enter into this promised land except Joshua and Caleb. That brings us to Joshua chapter one. I'm gonna read verses one to four. Why don't you read along with me? I'm reading from the New Living Translation. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, or as King James puts it, Moses' servant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promise Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I have given you from the Negev wilderness in the south uh, to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Isn't that powerful? Let's stop there. Here's point number one if you're taking notes. Greg is a very handsome man. Let me explain. <laughs> I know that seems self-serving, but no, I'm joking. That's not point number one. Um, that's my point. I wrote to myself because I have low self-esteem. Um, point number one, to succeed in the spiritual life, you must overcome your fear and admit that you need help. To succeed in the spiritual life, how many of you want to succeed as Christians? Raise your hand. How many of you want to fail? Okay, good, no hand. There's always one bro, oh, yeah, I do. If you want to succeed in the Christian life, in the spiritual life, you must overcome your fear and admit you need help. You need lots of help. You need Jesus. In case you didn't notice, Joshua was their leader. Joshua is simply the Hebrew version of Jesus. So they were led by Joshua. We are led and empowered by and indwelt by Jesus. But notice how many times God says to Joshua to have courage. Verse six, be strong and of good courage. Verse seven, only be strong and very courageous. Verse nine, have not I commanded you, be strong and be of good courage. Don't be afraid. Why do you think he said that so many times to Joshua? Probably because he was afraid. Because he was overwhelmed. Uh, think about, he, he's a successor to Moses. Talk about a hard act to follow. Moses? Yeah, Moses is dead, God says, and I've chosen you to lead these people into the promised land. I can think of times in my life where I've dealt with great fear. I remember when I was a young father, uh, 22 years old, and our first son was born. I was so excited when I found out Kathy was expecting, and now Christopher's born, and it suddenly dawned on me after we got home from the hospital, I don't know anything about parenting because I was never parented. I never had a father. It's like a big void in my life and my mother really didn't parent me. I was actually raised by wolves. I've never shared that before. <laughs> That'll be in the follow-up to Jesus Revolution. <laughs> Jesus Revolution two, raised by wolves. Um, look for it at a theater near you. But, but seriously, I was not parented. I didn't know what I was doing. I was afraid, but I called out to God. And you know, God gave me the strength to do what he called me to do. And I wasn't a perfect parent. I made mistakes. Uh, I think of Dr. Dobson who once said, every parent owes their first child an apology. <laughs> I think that's probably true. But the Lord helped me to be a father to Christopher and Jonathan and now grandchildren. It's a great privilege, but, but I was afraid. I felt so inadequate. So I called out to the Lord. I remember the first time the Lord prompted me to share my faith. I was 17 at this point, and I, I knew I should tell others about Jesus. I felt so inadequate for the task, but I found an older woman 
uh, on the beach. She was about the age of my mother and I walked up to her and opened up a little booklet and read it verbatim because I hadn't even memorized it. And amazingly, she accepted Christ. But I was so afraid. I was terrified by the prospect of going up to a stranger and engaging them in, evangelistic, in an evangelistic conversation. I remember the first time I, I did a prayer in front of a lot of people. It was the Billy Graham Crusade, it was, which was then called the Anaheim Stadium, now the Angel Stadium. 1985, and I was asked to pray, and on the platform was Billy Graham and the amazing members of his team, and I was so nervous, and uh, the moment came for me to pray, and I knew when I was supposed to pray, but I, I just froze, and Cliff Barrows, Billy's longtime associate, yelled over, get up there, man. I walked up, terrified, like, you know, the deer caught in the headlights, right? I've had those moments of fear, and, and I've learned to just Call out to the Lord. Face your fears. When you're afraid, remember these words from Joshua 1, 5 to 6. God says, I'll not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and be of good courage. Are you afraid right now? Is there something that's scaring you? Some obstacle in your path? Some addiction that seems to have a stranglehold on your life? Some other thing that you're dealing with and you're afraid? Here's what Jesus says. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom. When Timothy was just a young man, Paul wrote to him in 1 Timothy 6 and said, Timothy, I want to remind you, fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you. And God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So don't be afraid to tell others about Jesus. And we all have that fear at times. So face your fears. Listen, courage is the ability to keep going even when you don't see any progress because you know God is faithful. Let me say that again. Courage is the ability to keep going even when you can, can't see any progress because you know God is faithful. My friend J.D. Greer made that statement and I wrote it down. Number two, the way to succeed in the spiritual life is you must be consistent. Again, the way to succeed in the spiritual life is you must be consistent. Not in only the big things, but in the little things as well. Again, Joshua 1, verse 1, we read, After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, he came to pass, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, or King James, Moses' servant. Joshua had to succeed this larger-than-life figure. It was a daunting task, to say the least. Listen, Moses served his purpose in his generation, and that's what all of us are called to do. In Acts 12, 36, we read, after David had done the will of God in his generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors. And that's what we're all called to do. Serve the purpose of God in your generation. That's what I'm called to do. One day I'll die. And when you read, Greg Glory died, don't believe it. I'll be more alive than I've ever been in the presence of the Lord, right? But I understand that unless the Lord calls me to heaven first in the rapture, which I would prefer, Lord, are you listening? Um, <laughs> but if not, then I, like everyone else, will die. My job is to just serve God in my generation. And then that's your job, especially you who are young, to serve the Lord in your generation. That's what Moses did. He faithfully served the Lord. Listen, no one is indispensable. Graveyards are filled with indispensable people. One man, one woman finishes their task. God raises up another, and he does it again and again. And I love this promise God gave to Joshua, verse five. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. And God is with you as well, isn't he? Jesus said, when two or more are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Uh, he also said, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. And think about Joshua. Here, here's a guy that, he just served behind the scenes. I mean, he, he was kind of like Moses' personal assistant. Wherever Moses went, Joshua went. He didn't know he was being groomed to be the leader. But if you want to be a good leader, you have to first be a good follower. You have to learn how to help and support others. So it's not always about you. It's about the purpose, the bigger purpose the kingdom of God. 
And when Moses went up to receive the commandments of God up on Mount Sinai, Joshua went with him. And he just waited at the foot of the mountain as Moses receives these commandments and comes down and his face is shining. And Joshua says, hey man, Moses, things are not sounding good back in the camp. It sounds like there's a war down there. And they descend from this mountain and there they find the Israelites dancing in front of a golden calf naked. Here is Moses receiving the commandments and among those commandments it is stated, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no graven images. And here are the people dancing in front of an idol because Aaron was left in charge. Aaron was the worst babysitter in human history. <laughs> the brother of Moses left in charge. He effectively encouraged the people to do what they were doing. And then he had the audacity to say, I know this looks bad, but it's not my fault. We just threw our gold in the fire and this golden calf just came out. So what else could we do but strip off our clothes and worship it? I, the, none of this was true. He encouraged the people to bring their gold. And he was involved in, in making this golden calf that they were worshiping. But contrast Aaron and Moses. Aaron is irresponsible. Joshua, excuse me, contrast Aaron and Joshua. Joshua's faithful and the little things. And now God's gonna raise him up to greater things. Be faithful in the little things. And you watch what the Lord will do. Point number three. If you want to succeed in spiritually, you must know and keep the word of God. If you want to succeed spiritually, you must know and keep the word of God. This is so important. Look at verse eight. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do all that is written in it, and then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. By the way, what God said here to Joshua is unprecedented in the Bible up to this point. Prior to this, God spoke to people. God spoke to Noah and told him to build an ark. God spoke to Abraham and told him to go to a land he had never been to before. God spoke to Moses, to the burning bush, but for the first time, God says to Joshua, I'll speak to you through the book. I'll, and that's how God speaks to us today. I get a little suspicious when people tell me, oh, God spoke to me. Okay, I mean, I've had God speak to me too. But it's not like every morning he, we have you know, extended conversations. Well, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me that. We'll see. Okay, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But I know this much, God will speak to you through this Bible. You understand that? He'll speak to you through this book. Jesus said, lo, in the volume of the book I have come, it is written of me. That's why you need to open the book uh, or open the app on your phone. It's okay. Just open up the truth of Scripture and get it into your life. And this is what God was saying to Joshua. And this is what God is saying to us as well. And not just read it. Because, you know, you can read a bunch of verses without comprehension. You know what I'm talking about? You might boast, I read 10 chapters of the Bible today. Wow, amazing. What were they about? I have no idea. <laughs> oh. I'd rather read 10 verses with comprehension than 10 chapters without it. And that's why this distinction is made here in what God says to Joshua. You shall meditate in it day and night. Meditate. Now when the Bible uses the word meditate, it's not the same as Eastern meditation where one seeks to empty their mind, sit in a lotus position, wearing clothes from Lululemon, I don't know. <laughs> That's not what it means to meditate. It doesn't mean to empty your mind. In fact, it means to fill your mind. The idea of meditation in the Bible means to ponder it, to consider it, or to contemplate it. It could also be translated to mutter, <laughs> to mutter. The idea is you say it out loud. Sometimes when you read, you can read without comprehension and then you can read it out loud. Even by yourself, read it out loud. So you hear the words and, and that helps you comprehend them a little bit more clearly. And so meditate in it, contemplate it, think about it. It's called chewing your food, right? Enjoy it. And the Bible encourages not only meditation, but lots of it. Psalm 1, I think, just sums this all up perfectly. It says, blessed or happy is the man or woman 
Thou walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the word of the Lord. Listen, in it does he meditate day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that will bring forth fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. I memorized that when I was 18 years old. It's still with me today. That's why Bible memorization is so amazing, isn't it? The psalmist says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's good to hide the word of God in your heart. You know, it's good to carry a Bible in your purse or in your briefcase or in your purse or man bag, whatever it is, we call those things. But the best place to carry the word of God is in your heart. Memorize it. Don't tell me you can't memorize. I know you can. You memorize so much stuff. You memorize song lyrics. You memorize statements from films. You memorize sports scores from 20 years ago. And you tell me you don't have time in your day or space in your memory for the Word of God. You do, but you have to discipline yourself to do it. Notice it says, you observe all that is written in it. Meditate on the Word, contemplate the Word, think about the Word, and do all that is written in it. It's not for us to go to the Bible and pick out the parts we like and throw out the parts we don't like. Well, I really love what the Bible says about forgiveness and love and grace. I'm not so sure when the Bible gets into sexuality. Uh, you know, I don't know if I agree with that. I think it's okay for a couple to live together uh, and have sexual relations before they get married. Uh, I think it's okay for us to terminate the life of an unborn child uh, because it's our choice and it's our body. And you can say and think all these things, but that, the Bible teaches something contrary to all of those things. Life begins at conception in every child is precious in the sight of God. <laughs> and marriage is sacred. And God gave us sex. And in the best place for sex, and really the only place for sex, is in the safety of a marriage. Not before a marriage, not extramarital sexual relations outside of marriage. But well, well, I don't really agree with that. Well, I'm sorry, idiot, if you don't agree. <laughs> but you're wrong. You can think what you want to think and say what you want to say. And you can say things like, well, well my God would never, well, who is your God? My God's the God of the Bible. And I don't always like what he says. I'll be honest with you. There are times I read verses, <laughs> that's not very easy. I'm so for, supposed to forgive that person. I don't really want to do that. I don't in a way agree with that, but I do it. And then I see the blessing that comes from it. And I've come to realize even when God tells me to do something that I don't want to do, it's still for my own good. So I trust the Lord and just try to do what he tells me to do. This is a package deal. Jesus said, you are my disciples. If you do whatsoever, I command you. So don't tell me you're a Christian and then you go to the Bible and throw out parts you don't like and embrace parts you do like. According to what God said to Joshua, you're to keep all of these truths in your life. This is like the golden key of spiritual success or the password to unlock everything. If you have this password, if you have this golden key, if you will, you will find blessing in your life. And if you do not have this golden key in your life, you will find yourself faltering and failing and living in a perpetual spiritual wilderness. You say, Greg, tell me again, what's the golden key? It's the Word of God. It's reading the Word of God. It's contemplating the Word of God. It's meditating on the Word of God. It's memorizing the Word of God. And it's obeying the Word of God. That's how you succeed. You never outgrow this. You never get beyond this. I know this is Christianity 101, but I'm amazed at how even older believers still don't do this. You never get beyond this. Oh, I used to read the Bible every day, but you know, I don't need to do that anymore. Oh, really? I'd be like somebody saying, yeah, I used to be into the whole eating thing. You know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. I don't need any more. 
Oh, really? You're going to die, man. <laughs> Same thing. You need to feed yourself spiritually. Well, I've read that chapter before. I've read that verse before. Haven't you seen how something you've read before can come alive in an entirely new way on another day? That's why the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. Yeah, but it's the same words in the same Bible. Nothing's changed. Yeah, hallelujah. Isn't it great to have something that never changes in this changing culture? You can trust it. No, it doesn't change. That's the whole point. And as I read it, somehow the Holy Spirit takes a verse and applies it to me. Sometimes it happens in a sermon, doesn't it? I've had times where I'm listening to someone preach and they just say something, it's like they're talking right to me. That was just for me. And I trust the Lord will do that for people when I preach as well and when you share truths from the word of God with others. But it's all summed up in the parable of the sower where uh, Jesus said a sower went out to sow seed. A farmer went out and threw seed out. And back in those days they'd just throw the seed out. It would go wherever. Some seed fell on the roadside. The birds came and ate it. Some seed fell on ground that was embedded with weeds and the weeds overcame it and choked it. Uh, some seed fell uh, on shallow soil and shot up quickly and withered in the sun. And other seed fell on good ground and brought forth fruit. So that's called the parable of the sower. Only one out of four made it. It was a seed sown on good ground. And then he goes on to explain it. These are they, says Jesus, who hear the word of God and keep it. So if you want to be so good soil, if you want to grow spiritually, you hear the word of God and you keep it. So now let me sum this up and conclude. What is the golden key of spiritual growth? Hearing, receiving, and obeying the word of God. How can we enter this land of promises? Number one, to succeed in the spiritual life, you must overcome your fear and admit you need help, and lots of it. Face your fears. God is with you. He won't give you more than you can handle. There's always a way out of every temptation. Think about it, always a way out, always. No, I couldn't resist, no, you can, you could have. Sometimes the way out is as simple as the door, or hitting the off switch, or whatever it is you need to do. You take the practical steps. Um, let's say you have a problem with drinking. Okay, I get, I get tempted. Do you have alcohol in your house? Yeah, lots of it, tons of it. <laughs> I have a wine cellar. I live in the wine cellar, yeah. A bit of a problem. You have a problem with this? Pour it down the toilet and make sure you flush the toilet because the dog might drink it and get drunk. You don't want a drunk dog. Well, I have a problem with drugs. Get rid of your drugs. Can I sell them? No, do not sell them. <laughs> Get rid of them. Take action. I have a problem with looking at porn on my phone. Oh, well, get a filter on your phone. Well, I, I have one. That I, I found a way around it. <laughs> get a flip phone. I don't care. Get, get rid of your phone, but, but deal with it. Years ago, we were staying in some house, and someone gave us a big, giant container of pretzels with peanut butter in them. Have you ever tried those? I'm not even a huge peanut butter fan, but there's something about a pretzel with peanut butter I really like. It's a salty and the, you know, the sweet and the salty. So I ate one, oh, so good. And so you eat it, it's okay. Then you go, oh, that was good. Then you have another. And like I'm into the, I don't know, I have handfuls, not just eating them. I couldn't stop myself. So I literally took this giant thing of pretzels. <laughs> it's bad. I poured them in the toilet and flushed it. Kathy came out, where are those pretzels? I flushed them down the toilet. <laughs> you did not, you ate all of them. No, I did not. I flushed them down the toilet. Why? I was getting tempted, I couldn't stop. But sometimes you need to take radical steps. It's okay. Number two, the way to succeed in the spiritual life is you must be consistent. Not merely faithful in the big things, but in the little ones too. Be faithful in what God has said in your path. Be faithful with your finances. Be faithful in everything. Number three, if you want to succeed spiritually, you must know and keep the word of God. Study it. Memorize it. Obey it. Let me close with this. God gave to Israel that lamb. He said, slay that lamb and put the blood on your homes. And then in fulfillment of that, God sent his son Jesus. 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus was the Passover lamb who died for us. So maybe I'm talking to somebody right now who is racked with guilt because of bad decisions you've made. Maybe I'm talking to somebody right now that who is in the throes of addiction. You can't break free. Maybe I'm talking to someone right now who has a deep hole in their heart and you don't know how to fill it. You've gone after everything the culture says you should have and it's just gotten worse. You need Jesus. This is the one you're looking for. Only Jesus can forgive you of your sin. Only Jesus can give you eternal life and a life worth living this side of heaven. And Jesus, who died on the cross voluntarily for our sin, rose again from the dead three days later, and now he stands at the door of our life and he knocks and he says, if we'll hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in. Is there somebody here that would like to ask Jesus Christ to come into their life? Somebody who wants their sin forgiven? Someone who wants to get rid of their guilt? Someone who wants to be free from their addictions? Someone who wants to be free from the stranglehold of sin? It can happen for you that quickly. I was talking with a retired police officer earlier today and we're talking about people he's met who have had their lives transformed by Jesus Christ. And uh, he was sitting at a table at a men's prayer meeting at Harvest Orange County. And uh, there were a couple of guys there that, well, they had served time in prison. They had the tats to prove it. Prison tats are different than hipster tats. They mean something. And as an officer, he knew what different tattoos mean and the symbolism, maybe gang affiliation or whatever. But these guys were at a prayer meeting, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning for men. And, and as was the retired police officer. And he said, they were so transformed. And I said, how else would that happen? A former gang member and a retired police officer changed by Jesus Christ, talking together and praying together. That's what God can do. And everyone needs Jesus. Sure, the gangbanger needs Jesus. The criminal needs Jesus. The drug addict needs Jesus. The upright citizen needs Jesus. The relatively moral person who actually is still a sinner needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. You need Jesus. And if he's not in your life yet, he's just a prayer away. If you want Christ to come into your life and forgive you, respond to this invitation as we close now in prayer. Father, I thank you for the truth of scripture. Now I pray for every person here, every person watching and listening, wherever they are. If they don't have this relationship with you, let this be the moment they believe. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying together, maybe there's somebody here that would say, today I need Jesus. I want his forgiveness. I want to get rid of my guilt. I want to fill this hole in my heart. I want to know that I'll go to heaven when I die. I want to be ready for the return of Christ. I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. Pray for me. If you want Jesus to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to start this relationship with God today, wherever you are, I want you to lift your hand up. And I want to pray for you. Raise your hand up high where I can see it. God bless you. I'll pray for you today. Raise your hand up. Let me pray for you today. God bless you. Anybody else? You want Christ to come into your life. Let's pray together and let's get this resolved. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand up high. God bless you. Yeah, God bless all of you raising your hand. Some of you watching the screen. I can't see your hand, of course, but the Lord sees you. You can raise your hand too. Now I want every one of you that raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer with me. You could even pray it out loud. Again, as I pray this prayer, pray it out loud after me. Pray these words, Lord Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. I turn now from my sin and I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior and my Lord, as my God and my friend. Thank you for hearing this prayer, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. God bless you that prayed that prayer.